Hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of module six, which is on sequential circuit design. So far, we discussed about the combinational circuit design. However, all the systems or the circuits that you encounter in real life, they are sequential circuits. So all these systems are made up of some combinational logic block, and also they have something which stores the state of the uh, system. So the system state is also another variable. which comes into picture when you talk about sequential circuits and to store that system or to modify that system you require something which is a memory right so in this module we'll be covering about these memory blocks or these registers or whatever holds the system state their design as well as how these circuits basically work in uh, you know in resonance with your combinational logic design. so the schemas to mean the same So let us first talk about combinational circuits. So combinational circuits, we know that you know the output is only a function of current inputs, right? They were not the function of the past inputs. That is, output at t equals to like at time t equals to capital T. Let's say whatever inputs are there, which are being fed to the system, the outputs will depend only on those. They won't depend upon the past inputs. However, sequential circuits are way different than combinational circuits. So in sequential circuits. the output is not only a function of current inputs but it is also a function of the preceding inputs how so preceding inputs basically tune the or they define the state of the system and that is how they influence the output of sequential circuits it will be clear as i discuss along this slide so most circuits that you encounter in your daily life are some form of finite state machine what exactly is a finite state machine it's actually an assimilation of some combinational logic block and registers so what are registers registers are some systems which hold the state of any system i mean registers are some kind of circuits which hold system state system state is also a boolean variable right so let me show you the block diagram of a sequential circuit or of a fsm so this is the block diagram of a fsm you have m logic inputs which are your current inputs feeding a logic block combinational logic block then you have output of a memory block or a register so this is its output which is nothing but the current state of the system it consists of n bits so these n bits kind of encode the system state so this system state which is encoded by these n bits small n bits and these m logic inputs they are fed to the combinational logic block and then some logic output is obtained which is like say capital n bits and it also yields the next state of the system or you know the output of this also contains the next state uh, system variable or i would say next n bits which encode so it also in, uh, the output also consists of n bits which contains information about the next state of the system and this next state is fed into the memory or register and whenever the next active blockage comes this is sampled or this is kind of you know reflected at its output so this is input of this register this is output of this register whenever an active blockage comes here so typically these registers work at clock edge and not at clock levels i mean there are some memories which work even on clock levels but typically in modern circuit design most of these registers work on clock edge that is they work on the at positive to zero transition i mean they only work at zero to one transition that is called positive edge triggered uh, registers and if they are working or if they are sampling this input to their output at negative edge that is when the clock is going from one to zero then that those kind of registers are known as negative edge registers edge triggered registers so in short whatever input is coming here in the next cycle of clock or whenever the clock transitions let's say if it is a positive edge triggered register then whenever the clock goes from 0 to 1 this value here will be latched here if it is a d latch or if it is a d kind of register anyways don't confuse between these terms this i will be uh, you know explaining very clearly what exactly is a latch what exactly is a register but whatever value is here this system becomes transparent and whatever value is here it gets transferred to this term at the positive edge of this register if it is a positive edge triggered register however if this is a negative edge triggered register then whenever this clock signal over here makes a 1 to 0 transition whatever value is here will be transferred to this node 
and this happens at the next clock edge. I mean, whatever next state is coming at the next clock edge, or as soon as you know the active clock edge comes here, this will be transferred here and it will become the current state of the system. Okay, so this is how you know uh, your sequential circuits or FSM block is defined. Now the output here, this is the logical output, is a function of both the current state encoded by these n bits which input the system, I would say system state, and these current inputs, which are encoded by these M bits. Also, we have this next state, which is also N bits. So you can see that the current number of bits in the current state and the next state are equal because it is ideally you know, latched from here to here, or there is some functional block which operates at these inputs and gives you these outputs. So it has to be like, it does not introduce any new bits. That is what the message is. So if next state is n bits, current state could also be n bits. So next state, how do, how it is coming? It is coming through this combinational block and next state is also being generated by giving logic inputs as well as current inputs or current state as the input to this combinational block. Then what happens? This next state is retained here and the moment uh, active clock edge comes, this is transferred here and that becomes the current state and next cycle computation begins. So as I told, if it is an edge triggered register, next state bits are sampled and fed to the combinational block only when an active clock edge comes and the next cycle begins. So for one cycle, this current state and logic inputs will produce this logic output and next state. The moment a trigger or a clock edge comes, this will become the current state and the next cycle starts. So a new cycle is basically when new state bits are sampled here and then they are fed to this combinational box to generate the next state or the output for next cycle and the next state bits. And another important part or another important, I would say, uh, condition or another important attribute of this register is that it ignores changes in inputs until next stage. So only whatever data is present here at the active clock edge, whether be positive clock edge or a negative clock edge, only that is being sampled at this node, that is being transferred at this node. After that, when the clock is one or when the clock is zero, even if these inputs are changing, it won't affect the bits which are here at its output. So that is an important virtue of this register. So it ignores changes in inputs until the next clock edge or until the next active edge, depending upon whether the register is positive edge triggered register or a negative edge triggered register. It waits until that clock edge, an active clock edge. Even if the inputs are changing, it won't, you know, it won't kind of sample it here at the output. Okay. So what exactly are synchronous circuits? So you may have heard about synchronous circuits, asynchronous circuits. So you may have heard that in synchronous circuits, there's a global clock, which kind of, you know, uh, synchronizes all the, all the circuits and like all the circuits within that module. So in synchronous circuits, what exactly is the definition of that? all these registers, I mean, this is one FSM, there will be other FSMs or sequential circuits. So if all the sequential circuits are all the registers basically, because register is the one where you are giving clock as the input. So if all the registers are fed by same global clock and this global clock actually in sequential circuits, if this clock which triggers these switching events, right? So if in a system, all the registers are fed by the same global clock, which is kind of influencing the switching events, then we call that as synchronous circuits. Most of the circuits, almost 95 to 98% circuits that we encounter in daily life are synchronous circuits. There are asynchronous circuits as well, which are event driven. So in asynchronous circuits, all registers are not fed by the same clock. Depending upon some events, some of the registers may be fed by a clock or that event may go as a clock signal to the register. So that is an asynchronous circuit, right? Also, the thing is, or the most important thing here is the next cycle or the next cycle of computation cannot begin unless all computations in the present cycle have been performed. So if you have series of such sequential circuits, so until and unless all the computations have been performed in all these sequential circuits, you won't apply a next clock edge, active clock edge. So basically your clock period depends upon 
the worst case time it takes for computing one such sequential circuit right computing the output of one such sequential circuit so now let us look at some of the timing definitions because since we are talking about clock signal and we are saying that everything is synchronized with respect to this clock signal there are some timing definitions or there are some timing constraints and there are some new terms that you will encounter there so let us discuss that timing like let us discuss those definitions first so let's say i have m inputs i have a combination logic clock this is my current state which is n bits this is my capital n bit output logic output and then i have small n bit next state output bits and this is fed to a d register i am saying that it's a d register right now if this is going to the d terminal and it is being clocked let's say it's a positive edge triggered register so if it's a positive edge triggered register then what happens let us look at the timing diagram so if it's a positive edge triggered register whenever the clock is going from 0 to 1 what happens this d is sampled at this q node okay and only at this transition whenever it is going from 0 to 1 transition whatever is present at this d here it will get transferred to this q obviously it takes some delay i mean if it is so if the clock edge is coming here right and if d is this value or this value here it takes this tcq delay that is clock to q delay and then it like it is reflected in q why is this tcq there i mean why is this clock to q delay there or register delay there because this is also made up of some combinational circuit and whenever you talk about combinational circuits so in the internal of this d register there would be a combination logic clock so whenever you talk about the combinational circuit whenever the input comes the output comes only after a propagation delay right so this propagation delay of a register is kind of defined from clock to q why clock to q because this register's operation is synchronized with respect to this clock and not with respect to this input so whenever this clock goes from 0 to 1 this latch becomes or this uh, register becomes transparent and this input whatever input was there at this instance that is transferred to q so it will be reflected at q only after a delay which is tcq or clock to q delay so this is how you know this uh, d register performs there are other definitions the other timing definitions which i'll be talking about now so first to talk is this setup time so you see that this is your d input and then this is your d input i am saying that it can vary in this region it can vary in this region from here to here but in this small region on either side of the clock edge so this is your clock edge so either side of the clock edge there is a range in which it has to be stable it cannot vary if it is one it has to be in one it is if it is zero it has to remain zero it cannot switch between one and zero i mean it cannot toggle and what is the duration during which it cannot toggle so if this is the clock edge if this is the active clock edge the su time before this clock edge which is the setup time before this clock edge and the hold time after this clock edge it has to remain stable now what are these setup times and hold times so setup time is the time before the clock edge this during which the data input must be valid what i mean by must be valid it should not change it should not toggle right so if this is the clock edge active clock edge t setup time before this the data should not change this is the definition of setup time now what is this t edge or t hold t hold is time after the clock edge for which the data input must remain valid or it should not change or toggle right so this is the definition of setup and hold time each of these registers are characterized by these setup times and hold times what exactly is the physical meaning of setup time and hold time i'll let you know some slides later but for the time being you should just remember that each of these registers have this setup time which is the time before the clock period or the clock time before the clock edge when your input must remain stable and they also have some hold time which is the time after the clock edge for which the data must remain valid otherwise you will sample something wrong at the output there would be violations there would be these setup time or hold time violations and you will 
uh, sample something else at the output. You won't be able to sample the exact value of D which you wanted to sample, right? So that is the problem. I will definitely talk about these things in detail. And then as I told, there's this TCQ or register propagation delay, which is clock to Q time. So it's the worst case propagation delay with reference to the clock edge because in synchronous circuits, everything happens at the clock edge. So we talk with respect or the reference point is this clock edge itself. So worst case propagation delay from this clock edge for this D input to get transferred to this Q, right? That is called TCQ. So at this clock edge, whatever D was here, it gets transferred to Q only after this TCQ. And it's the worst case. I mean, it's the worst propagation delay. There's also something which is called contamination delay, which is the minimum delay. So depending upon the inputs, there can be a larger delay or there can be a small delay, right? Because in combinational circuit, we saw that the delay actually depends upon what is the combination of inputs, right? So based on that, there can be worst case propagation delay and there can be a minimum propagation delay and that minimum propagation delay we call, it, call as contamination delay. Now in the last slide, we saw that you know the computation of any block must be performed within one clock cycle. Or computation for next clock cycle cannot begin unless all the computations for first clock cycle is done, right? So in between this rising edge to the other rising edge, what should be done? What kind of computations must be done? First, this input over here, I mean the next state bits must be copied here. So once the clock edge is going from zero to one, this input here must be latched here, right? So this input must be latched here. What is the time it takes from this reference? It is TCQ. So whatever input is here, it goes here at TCQ, right? If you are taking the clock edge as the reference. So in one cycle, this has to come here. And then whatever input is coming here, along with the present inputs, the combinational logic block must perform the computation and it should be reflected at the output and as the next state, right? So before the next clock edge, what should happen? I mean, let's say the clock edge started here. I mean, the clock edge started here. So here, what happened? The next state was copied here. So that takes a delay of PCQ and then worst case delay of PCQ and then it passes through a combination logic block. So that combinational logic block delay is also added to it, right? So Combinational logic. So first TCQ is added, combinational logic delay is added. And before the, this next transition, it has to remain stable for this T setup time as well. So once this clock edge starts, so after TCQ, it is available here. Then after T propagation delay of this combinational logic block, it is available at here and here. Now this input to this has to remain stable for T setup time before the next clock edge. Right. So what can you say about the maximum? Like, what can you say about the minimum clock period? The minimum clock period has to accommodate this TCQ. It has to accommodate this combinational logic propagation delay, worst case propagation delay. And it also has to accommodate the setup time because that is something which is inherent to this register. I will tell you what exactly is the physical significance, but right now going by the definition that the input has to be stable before this clock edge. So this time has to be given to this input, right? Input has to be stable for that much amount of time. So the minimum clock period is basically TCQ plus TP logic, which is the worst case uh, delay through this combination logic plus T setup, right? So this is the constraint for the minimum clock period of any sequential circuit design. Now there's another constraint, which is on hold. So what exactly hold means? Hold means that after this clock edge, the data input should not so after this clock edge, the data should remain constant for this T hold time. Now, when will the data not be constant? Let's say this clock edge comes, okay, this clock edge comes and then the, this has to stay, has to be stable for T hold time, right? This input has to be stable for T hold time. Let's say the clock edge comes and the, at that moment, the input is such that it gives you the contamination delay of this register. That is the minimum delay of this register. So the clock edge comes, it gets transferred here. The time period is minimum clock or the contamination delay of the register or the minimum propagation delay of this register. And then for such inputs, let's say 
even this combinational logic block is giving you the minimum delay or the contamination delay. So the fastest, or uh, I would say the fastest that this input over here can again like can lead to some change at this. So again, let me tell you in a different way. So let's say that the clock edge has arrived and the input here is such that it corresponds to minimal delay of this resistor. So after this clock edge transition, this input is available. That is the like current state is available. Let's say at TCD of resistor. Now let's say that this combination makes the worst case, or, or I would say the minimum delay even for the combination. Image. So this is also present. So worst case is that this end state bits are such that it is presenting minimum delay for this register as well as the combination of this current state and the inputs are presenting minimum delay for this combination logic block. So the fastest that this data can you know lead to a change in the next state is when the clock edge arrives, contamination delay of this register plus contamination delay of this combination logic block and it will be available here, right? And the input will be changed. So input of this D will be changed. The minimal delay after which the input can be changed is the TCD of this register plus the contamination delay of this combinational logic. So contamination delay of this register plus the contamination delay of this logic block will lead to like after this time, after this time passes, it will lead to a change in this input. But we want our input to not change before this T hold. So what constraint that puts on T hold? Your TCD register, that is when the clock edge arrives, the minimum delay of this plus the minimum delay of this, after which the input is changing over here, it should be greater than or equal to T hold, right? So these are two constraints on, yeah, you know, whenever you have any sequential circuit, these are two constraints which you have to always, you know, follow. This T is the clock period. You want it to be as small as possible, but this is something which is you know, degrading it. So in real circuits, I mean, in practical uh, digital circuits which you encounter in your daily life, it's the setup time and the PCQ, which is kind of, you know, meaning, like, uh, which is kind of limiting it nowadays, the clock period. This TCD register plus TCD logic greater than the old, this almost holds true for the present circuit. So we don't worry much about this. But we have to worry about these parameters, TSU and TC. And we have to worry about it. Why? Because you know this is de determining the minimum clock period or the maximum frequency. And we always want to increase the frequency of our systems. So what exactly happens in the industry? So in the industry, what happens is there are dedicated tools which kind of find out what is the maximum frequency at which your module can work at. And that kind of analysis is called static timing analysis. Uh, please, I would say, please go through this section in very details because this is something which is asked in your placements. I mean, whenever you are applying for any digital system or circuit design profile, RTL verification, any profile, Intel, Qualcomm, whatever you, wherever you, static timing analysis is something that will always be asked. It is not in the syllabus of this course, but I have ensured that you know you are aware about what is happening in the industry and it will definitely help in your placements as well. So please, uh, you know, understand this well. And if you can't understand this, if you have doubt about any aspect of STA, please ping me in the tutorial se session or please ping me in the discussion session. So timing analysis, nowadays, no one does it with hands. There are dedicated tools which kind of perform these analysis. And one of the analysis that these tools perform is called static timing analysis. For synchronous designs, the static timing analysis is sufficient. But when you have asynchronous design or when you have event-driven designs, this dynamic timing analysis is also important. Dynamic timing analysis, I would say no company will ask you this. It is also beyond the scope of, you know, even a PG course on this digital circuit. So I am not including this. But static timing analysis is something which is very important. You should know what exactly the tool does, at least what exactly the tool does. Or if you are given to, you know, find out the critical path or find out, uh, you know, what exactly is the maximum frequency at which any system can operate, any simple system can operate, then you can use these concepts and find it. So 
if you are talking about the tool what does the tool do tool basically checks all the possible path for timing violations now what is timing violation timing violation is simply this if it is violating any of these two constraints it's called timing violation so it just checks for so first of all it looks for all the possible paths then it checks for these timing violations whether these constraints are satisfied on those paths or not again a important point to be noted is that it only checks the worst possible delay on the path and not the functionality so the static timing analysis tool is not bothered whether your correct logic or correct output is coming at that mode or not. it is just bothered about the timing constraints it is just bothered that those timing constraints are uh, being you know they are being fulfilled they are not being violated and the inputs are coming at the right time with respect to your clock edge that's the only point it just it just you know ensures that whenever the clock edge is coming the input which has to be sampled to node q is being sampled that's all your sta does and because it is not bothered about you know your output whether it's coming correct or not whether the functionality is coming correct or not it's just bothered about whether the correct value which is which was supposed to come at q is coming or not so it is much faster than circuit simulation so let us see what exactly happens in a static timing analysis what exactly the tool does it simply checks for the present of correct for the presence of correct data of each register or each synchronous element at the arrival of clock edge so it just checks for those two timing constraints if those are met then definitely whatever input had to be sampled originally at q that will be sampled upon arrival of the active clock edge so the steps that the tool takes is first it breaks the design into different set of paths so there can be several paths going from input to the output in any combinational circuit or in any you know practical digital circuit so it basically breaks that design into sets of all those paths right and then what it does is it calculates the propagation delay along each path so it first breaks it like it first breaks it into a series of paths and then it calculates the propagation delay along all these paths and then it checks for these timing violations or these constraints whether they are met or not inside the design and also at the io ports because input output ports also lead to some amount of delay so it kind of takes into account both the timing violations inside the design and also taking care of the input output ports now what are the constraints constraints definitely it's the clock period because that defines the maximum frequency of operation and also there are some primary inputs and outputs which are which can be constant in some specialized circuits not on all but in some specialized circuits but clock period is something which is a constraint right so as a consumer let's say i tell that my processor has to work at 3 gigahertz now i have made some circuit or the company has made some processor now this sta tool what it will do is it will basically break that microprocessor design into several parts calculate delay at each of those parts and then try to find out what is the maximum frequency or what is the maximum clock period or sorry what is the maximum frequency or what is the minimum clock period for which these timing constraints which i have stated in the previous slide are satisfied for all the parts that is how these st tools work right then what happens let me tell talk about the timing paths so i have been taking talking about these paths so what are the different paths so timing paths they can be different types of timing paths there can be data paths there can be clock paths there can be clock beating paths there can be asynchronous paths so there can be several kinds of paths through which the information may propagate right the timing signals may propagate so what does the like how do you classify different paths so the different paths depend upon the starting point and the end point so you can have a data path you can have a clock path you can have a clock gating path now what is clock gating so suppose there is some synchronous like there is some synchronous circuit in your block in which you don't like which is not being or which is not being used when the other ones are being used so in order to save power what you would try to do is you won't want it to get clogged because the moment it is clogged dynamic power dissipation is there right so if there is some synchronous block which is not being used at that time you would avoid clocking it 
So to avoid clocking it, what you'll do is in the path of its clock, you'll add a conditional, like you'll add a combinational block, which will provide the clock signal to the synchronous circuit only when it is needed. Something like, you know, enable signal. So you'll have an enable signal added with the clock and then only it will be provided. So you'll have an enable signal added with the clock and then it will be provided to the clock input of your register. Something like that. And that is why it's called conditional clock. Only as long as enable signal is on, your clock is fed to that system. Otherwise the clock is not fed, right? And by this people kind of reduce the dynamic power. So this clock gating is a really, uh, I would say promising approach. Now let us first talk about the data paths. So here is your data path. There are basically four kinds of data path, path one, path two, path three, and path four, right? So let us talk about first path one. So path one is basically starting from the data input port and it's going to the input of a register. So data input port to input of register, right? This is path one. What is path two? Part two is starting from this clock terminal of this register and going to its output or going to the next stage or going to the input of another register. So this, this path, path one, starting point is input port, end point is input of a register. Part two, starting point is input terminal of the, or input, I would say input pin of the register and its output is or the end, like its end point is input of a input terminal of another register. Part three, what is the input? Input is your clock terminal of the register. And what is the output? Output is the data output or the output, basically output of the circuit, output port, right? These are path one, path two, and path three. They can be a simple path, which you encounter in you know, your, your uh, combination of circuits, input port to output port via combination logic block, right? So these are different, four different kinds of data path. Now let us see what are different types of clock path. So if this is your, if these are your flip-flops, let's say you have one flip-flop here, you have one flip-flop here, you have a combination logic in between. So this is representing your data path. So the path from this show, wherever the clock is being generated, wherever the clock is being generated, the path from that point to the clock terminal or the clock pin of register. That is called the clock path. So in general, the clocks are generated by a quartz crystal and then that is fed to a digital PLM, phase lock loop. It simply, you know, doesn't allow any phase change in your clock so that your clock is uniform. I mean, so oscillators because of process variations or, you know, because of temperature variation or temp temperature variation as they are operating, what may happen is that they may, you know, the frequency may remain same, but, or even the frequency may change because of temperature or the phase may change. So this PLL, it has a negative feedback loop. That feedback loop takes into account that, you know, the phase remains same. So it kind of locks the phase. And so your clock is very stable when you are using this TPL. And digital PLLs are actually very active area of research. And it's one of the most researched thing in uh, digital domain right now. So from this uh, generation point of the clock to the clock pin of these registers, there can be several paths. For instance, you know, we have these clock buffers, then there can be a clock divider. Why these clock buffers are used? To regenerate. Why? Because there would be this interconnect delay and because of interconnect delay, what may happen? There can be rise time and fall time. So what these buffers do? They basically regenerate the signal and reduce the rise time and fall time, right? So because of these buffers in the path, the delay from this origin to this and this origin to this, they are different clock paths. So this is one clock path. This is another clock path. So these are clock paths. Now what is clock gating path? So clock gating path is something like this. So the clock pin of this register is being fed by the clock as well as some other external signal, which kind of tells you whether to turn this, whether to feed this clock here or not. Something like that, right? So that you know you can reduce dynamic participation when this is not in use. Now there's something which is called critical path. So all these paths are taken into account by this STA2. Now, what it tries to find out, the STA2 tries to find out something which is called critical path. We already discussed about it in combinational circuit design, right? 
So the path with longest delay is called critical path. And what is so special about it? So if the critical path is kind of you know following all the constraints, then you are sure that your system will work at that frequency of operation. So critical path is the path on which typically you do this ST. You first search the path with longest delay, and then you see whether that is meeting constraints or not. So there's something which this tool does. So this tool finds out slack. What is slack? Slack is basically difference between arrival of clock and the correct input. Or it is a difference between arrival time or the required time minus the arrival time. Let's say the signal was supposed to come here at t equals to 10 nanosecond. That is the required time. But now if it is coming at t equals to 11 nanosecond, what is the difference between the two? Required time minus the arrival time is negative. 10 minus 11, that is negative. So if the required time minus arrival time is negative, it is called negative slack, right? And this tool basically tries, the STA tool basically tries to find out critical path first, and then it tries to it tries to see whether it is meeting the timing constraints or not. How? By identifying, how does it identify critical paths? So it finds the paths with longest delays, in case of you know loops in the system, it may be very difficult to do this. And then it gives you an idea about the paths with negative flag. Negative flag simply means that those constraints are not satisfied. Then what you need to do, you need to change those paths. You need to change something in those paths. Either you need to you know uh, change the constraint on the time period that you cannot do because the consumer has given it to you. You can only change your microprocessor design. If Intel tells me, if Intel tells me that you know I need three gigahertz processor, I can only change the design or circuitry of that processor. I cannot change that three gigahertz constraint because then I lose him as as my customer. So that is something that people can't do. So what they do is they kind of insert some buffers or something in that path so as to reduce the delay. So a question may arrive, arise that you know adding buffers will actually increase the delay because that buffer delay is being increased. But what happens is in circuits where you know you have long interconnects or where you don't have regenerative circuits what happens the rise and fall times become very large and you may remember that you know when i was discussing about the impact of rise and fall times i told that the propagation delay is also a function of rise and fall times your propagation delay is also eta times rise and fall times i mean there is this propagation delay of the logic considering step input plus this eta times rise and fall times. So if the rise and fall times become very large, then that component starts to dominate. And that is something which makes the system much smaller, much uh, like, you know, uh, sluggish, or I would say much slower. So these buffers are added. Although these buffers, you know, introduce propagation delay of an inverter or two inverters basically, but they reduce the rise and fall times, which becomes a major component if you're Combination logic is not regenerated, right? And that is one of the reasons why you know we go for static CMOS design as well. Now you see that you know everything is making sense. I mean, whatever we discussed earlier, it's kind of corroborating with whatever we are discussing now, right? Also, it looks for false paths. So there can be some false paths in your design. What are these false paths? How do you define it? So these false paths are kind of physically present, but actually there is no data transmission on them. What is an example? So let's say if one control signal is feeding, you know, two MUX. So no information passes through the control terminal of a MUX. It's only from the input to the output. So if you're trying to find out, you know, if you're trying to apply this static timing analysis on that path, which is feeding the in control signal of MUX, then it's of no use, right? So those are false paths and they should be masked during this static timing analysis. So even this thing is something which this tool does. STA tools do, right? Now with that, we know what exactly static timing analysis, which definitely is very important from placement perspective. Please understand it well. Any questions in this portion, let me know. Now that we know about this, let us try to understand the physical significance of setup and hold time. 
here we just like in the last slide we just mentioned that you know time before this clock transition for which the data should be stable set up time time after the clock clock transition for which the data should be stable hold time but what exactly is this how does it come into picture why should we worry about it? right so let me discuss about the physical meaning of this setup and hold time for discussing that let me take this case where we have a resistor its input terminal or its d input it's a d register so its d input is fed by this path we have a buffer and a combinational logic which is feeding this d input here and the propagation delay of this path is the propagation delay of d input now its clock pin is also fed by this clock but that is being passed through a buffer and a combinational logic clock and we call this propagation delay from clock terminal to this clock pin from this clock input to this clock pin of the register we call the propagation delay as tpd clock and from this d input to this actual pin of this d pin of this register the propagation delay is dpd d input so we have considered a system with positive edge trigger d flip flop this and here inherent assumption is that you know we are not bothered about this inherent setup and hold time of this system we are talking about this whole system at a time let's say that this register setup and hold time is 0 0 for the timing just for you know understanding what exactly setup and hold time of any system so i am talking about the system over here i am talking about the system over here so what is the setup and hold time definition i mean what is the physical meaning to understand that let us say that we are talking about deep flip flop let us not include the setup inherent setup and hold time of this d flip flop okay now let us you know uh, talk about the functionality of this register so what exactly should happen when it is operating correctly correct input from d that is d in will reach here after this propagation delay clock will reach here like clock edge if a clock edge is here it will reach after this propagation delay to this pin so what must happen Correct data from D in, correct value of this D in must reach the D pin over here at the positive edge of clock. This is reaching here after TPD D in. This is reaching here after TPD clock. But this should reach, or I would say both should reach here together, right? Both should reach here together so that Q, which is sampled, is correct. Okay. However. However, like I would say, however hard you try to make the two part delays equal, even if you use the same circuits, because of process variations, you won't be obtaining same delay, right? So in any case, however you have designed these two paths, you will have two cases, depending upon the value of TPD D in or TPD clock. What are the two cases? Let us consider them one by one. The first case is your propagation delay of this path along the input pin is larger as compared to the propagation delay of the clock now what this means since this propagation delay is larger clock has already reached here but the correct input you want at d at the clock edge has not reached here right but you want it to reach simultaneously what you can do what you can do to make or to rectify this or to correct, uh, to capture the data correctly you apply d in tpd in minus tpd clock before the clock edge so once the clock edge is applied before that itself you apply this tpd in. how much before tpd in minus tpd clock if you apply this if you apply this input d input here tpd in minus tpd clock time before the clock edge then you are sure that both will arrive here at the same time this is the definition of setup time right that the data should be applied tsu before clock edge do you understand the physical significance now i am repeating it again we have a case in which this propagation delay of this block or this path is larger than this path so when the clock edge is applied here i mean when the clock edge and d input are applied simultaneously here clock edge is like clock edge arrives here early d input arrives here later how much later tpd in minus tpd clock now 
if you apply this input epd in minus tpd clock before this clock edge what happens they reach here at the same time and you sample the correct output at q so the time at which you are applying this d input before the clock edge so as to get the correct output here that is known as the setup time right so the data has to be stable this d has to be applied and it has to be stable t setup time before the clock edge that is the difference between tpd and tpd clock right now let us see what exactly is the other case if your clock propagation delay is larger than tpd so if let's say the clock propagation delay is larger as compared to tpd then what happens d is already here and the clock is arriving late so if you are not holding this d till the clock arrives here what happens you may sample the d which is intended for the next clock edge i'm saying that d and clock edge are being shooted together it is being fed together now clock edge has not reached here d has already reached then what will happen the next clock edge will be shooted and d will be shooted here so whatever was meant for the next cycle that also may be sampled right if d is not held till what time till tpd clock minus tpd d at this moment so to capture the data correctly in this case d input should not change tpd clock minus tpd after the clock edge after this clock edge is sent from here right otherwise we will sample d intended for next cycle what is this th this th is the time for which d in must remain stable after this clock edge and hence it is called the hold time so this is your physical significance of setup and hold time why do we even talk about it? registers have their internal combinational block like this so d into clock and d into this they would have their internal logic internal logic combination units and if so they have a internal setup and hold time different registers since their internal combinational logic is different they'll have different setup time different hold times right and we'll calculate those for different registers for much space latches for much space registers for dynamic registers we'll be doing that don't worry we'll be doing that and we'll be understanding why exactly it's coming like that right now the thing is that you know it's not very easy here we are saying that only we have tpd in and tpd clock but if there are multiple paths or even if there is single path because of process variations there can be minimum delay there can be a maximum delay depending upon you know the combination of certain type of combination circuit and so on so in that case how these equations are transformed so in that case if your tpd in max that is the delay along this path maximum delay along this path if that is greater than minimum delay along this path then what should be done this input should be applied tpd in max minus tpd clock min before the clock edge that is the setup time in that case is or the dean has to be stable tpd in max minus tpd clock min time before the clock edge so setup becomes tpd in max minus tpd clock min in the second case if tpd clock max if this maximum delay along the clock path is larger than the minimum delay along this input path then what happens data comes before this clock and then this data has to remain stable here for time which is given by t clock max tpd clock max minus tpd in min if you keep that data stable after the clock edge for that time then only you will see that d and clock are you know whatever d you wanted to sample that is actually present so that gives you the whole time constraint when you have multiple paths or when you have tvt variations and as i told it, so this d flip flop or uh, let's not call it flip flop let's call it register for timing because uh, the way registers and flip flops are kind of defined is different in ravi and we'll be sticking to that definition itself but in your previous like ac201 you may have seen or you may have referred to this as d flip flop dfl 
I'll write it BFF because that's something that you may be understanding by then. So since this DFF itself has its internal combinational blocks between D and Q and clock and Q, so there is this concept of setup and hold time, which is similar to this, right? Here it was from D input to D pin of this register, clock input to clock pin of the register. Internally, it's from D to Q and C to Q. And then we have setup and hold. Now let us discuss what exactly are timing violations. So let us talk about that. So there is first setup violation. What is setup violation? If the input data changes within T time, within TSU time, which is where TSU time is the setup time of that register before the active clock edge. So the clock edge is going to come. If it is changing T setup time before that active clock edge, it's a setup violation. Hold violation, if the input data changes within TH after the clock edge, then it's a hold violation, right? Now, to understand this setup violation and hold violation, instead of looking at you know, the previous case, which was only one D register, let us look at the case, which is more towards a practical case. That is, we have two flip flops, and in between, we have a combinational logic. And these two flip flops, or these two uh, registers, let me call them registers itself, and these two registers are fed by a common clock, which is common in your synchronous circuit. Right? So you have this flip flop one, you have this flip flop two. Right? And there is this combinational logic in between. So what is the data path here? Data path is from C to Q, then through this combinational logic to the input of this FF2. Right? And this is clock of flip-flop one, right? And this is clock of flip-flop two. We assume that they are overlapping. I mean, there's uh, you know complete mismatch between the two clocks. However, because of this wire, there can be a mismatch and then it would shift slightly towards the right because of that delay and there would be overlaps. There would be non-overlapping region as well. Here, it, if it is shifting towards right, then here it is zero and it would be one. So there would be those clock non-overlapping zones as well, right? And that clock non-overlapping zone, if you have this clock and clock bar, if this is clock and this is clock bar, then that non-overlapping Clocks become overlapping zone in clock and clock bar, and that is dangerous situation. I'll discuss in the next next lecture why it is dangerous, but uh, that is dangerous thing. So we have to make paths balanced for each of the registers. Whatever, whenever this clock is arriving at this register, it should arrive at the same time at this register. So how can we ensure that we apply a combinational logic or a buffer here so that it provides a delay, delay equivalent to this interconnect delay, so that the clock edge reach these at the same time. Okay, enough of this discussion. Let me come to this uh, two, two register based system. So data is launched from this fifth flop one. It goes to fifth flop one Q at positive edge of this clock, right? This is what happens. Whenever the positive edge of clock comes, this D is transferred to this Q, right? And then it passes through the combinational delay logic block and it goes to this. And then at the next clock edge, at this clock edge here, what should happen? This should be sampled here, right? Let me again reiterate this. So FF1D, data is launched from FF1D to FF1Q. Once this pause edge comes, whatever data is here, that is transferred here. Then it passes through this combination logic. And then at the next clock edge here, what happens? This data which has come here should pass to Output of this. So at FF2D, that is at the D pin of FF2 here, data is coming from FF1Q through a combination block. And it is sampled to this output only at the next clock edge. Right? Why? Because unless this computation has been performed, next cycle cannot start, right? That is what we define. That is how we define. It. Okay. Now the data is captured at FF2D as positive clock edge of FF2. So this is kind of see whenever clock edge is coming together, this is transferred like this is transferred here. This is also transferred here, but this value is actually the value obtained from previous cycle, previous clock edge of this, right? Because if both are both edges are coming together, this data even if it goes here, it cannot be captured because it won't propagate here directly. It has to go through this combinational block 
and it can propagate to this point only after a delay and to take into account we only capture this data which is coming here in the next cycle so data path is in the first block edge here it goes here then it passes through the combination block and in the next block edge this is sampled here so at the first block edge what is happening these sampled to q and the value here in the previous clock cycle of ff2 that is transferred not the same clock cycle right so data is captured at ff2d at passage of this ff2 right so we can say that this is the launching flip flop this is the launching register this is the capture register this is data like this is the launching the data this is the cap this is capturing the data what is the data path data path i already told that it is ff1 clock to ff1 queue and then to ff2d this now data should propagate through data path in only one cycle so upon this clock edge what should happen this should come here and then it should propagate via this combinational block then it should remain stable for this key setup of the next register and then only in the next clock edge this value should be sampled here right so we always see we always check for setup violations at the next clock edge here why so because setup comes into picture only at the next clock edge here at this clock edge what is happening when this clock edge is coming this is transferred here and data which was stable here from the previous cycle is transferred here it doesn't have anything to do with setup time only once this data comes here it comes here then it has to remain stable for the setup time before the positive edge of this clock so setup violations are always checked at the next clock edge what about hold violations hold violations are checked at the same clock edge right so this will become clear this will also become clear why so because you know data has to remain that data has to be held so let's say we are talking about this clock edge so whatever data came here now it has to be held after this clock edge so it can be done at the same clock edge as well. this will become clear in the next slide but let us first discuss this setup files by an example so let us take this uh, you know uh, setup setup file setup analysis at ff2 here so the data at ff1 here it should reach ff2d before this clock edge plus the setup time like right? uh, so this propagation delay plus the setup time should be encompassed in that clock time period let us look at the timing diagram right so let us look at the clock so the clock is same for every for the two let's say that this is the launch edge and at the launch edge what happens whatever was present at ff1d here after a delay of tcq it will get to this q terminal right so after a delay of tcq it got here now after the combinational logic delay it got to this point ff2d here so this this was transferred to ff2d here this is the combinational delay this was the tcq now if this is your capture edge of clock and if this is your setup time so the data must reach here at this time right but it reached here at a time which is smaller than the required time so if the arrival time is smaller than the required time what is the slack required time minus arrival time which is positive let me reiterate this again and this is very important concept so i am repeating it again and again at launch edge of clock what happens whatever data is there in ff1 data present at d input of ff1 this is transferred to this after a propagation now a register delay of tcq which is this so whatever was here earlier ff1 q was zero it got to one after this tcq now this will be transferred or this will propagate through this combinational block and reach this ff2 d input only after the combinational logic delay so it reached here now we wanted it to reach setup time before the clock edge right that is the definition of setup time we want the data to be available there and to be stable there 
एट लीस्ट सेटअप टाइम बिफोर द क्लॉक एच टी एस यू बिफोर द क्लॉक एच सो दिस वॉज द रिक्वायर्ड टाइम वेन इट अराइव हियर इट अराइव क्वाइट अर्ली राइट सिंस द रिक्वायर्ड टाइम इज लार्जर दैन द अराइवल टाइम माई स्लैक इज पॉजिटिव एंड देर इज नो सेटअप फाइल so the delay is basically tcq1 right plus tq combination plus the setup so that is a delay so the data ff1d should reach ff2d with this delay t setup time before passage of clock ff2 this is this point right? this is the definition of setup and what is slack slack is required time minus arrival time only if there is a negative slack only let's say if this combination delay was larger then it would have reached here at this instance and then setup violation would happen because the arrival time would have been larger than required so it would have been negative slack now let us do this hold analysis at ff2 so hold analysis simply means that data at ff2 should not change between t and t plus tx i mean if the data has arrived at this ff2 then it should not change between t and t plus the hold time here since it's constant It's not changing after t or t equals to t plus t h as well, so there is no hold violation here. Also, what that means is, if it has to remain stable, what it means is that the data intended for the next cycle should not reach here before t hold. So, how can the data which is intended for next cycle reach there? So. let's say we are talking about this ff2 here it gets a positive edge clock at the same time ff1 also gets a positive edge clock right so data from here gets transferred here it also gets transferred here and it reaches the input here now if contamination delay of this is considered and contamination delay of this combination logic is considered then this hold timing constraint simply means that the key hold should be smaller than the hold of this flip flop must be smaller than tcd of this plus tcd of this that is whatever data is coming at this i mean whatever data is sampled at the launch flop i mean this is your launch launch flip flop or i would say at the launch register whatever data is being sampled at the launch register this should not propagate to this input before the hold time of this if it does then it's a hold violation let us look at hold violation in detail so let us look at this circuit hold violation is typically present in the case when you have buffers so in general i mean in general the idea is that the clock cannot reach all the flip flops or resistors at the same time by right? before because you apply buffers to uh, you know regenerate these clock signals you have these wire delays you have process variations even if you know the wires are of constant length then because of process delays they'll have different resistance different capacitance and as such they'll reach here at different instances right now let us say that you know this is your cap this is your uh, launch flop this is your capture flop and this delay is small let's say the delay between this terminal to this terminal it's very small then what happens if this is smaller than the hold time of this then at the same clock edge At the same clock edge, whatever data is sampled here, it reaches here before the hold time, and as such, there would be hold violation. So, if the delay between FF one FF one clock to FF one D FF two D one, if the delay between this, so what is that delay? It's basically, is TCD of this resistor plus contamination. Delay. So, the delay of this FF one C to FF one Q, and then the contamination delay of this logical element present here. If it's very small, then any change in FFT at the capture edge here can get reflected to this input, and the input can change before the hold time, and that is what is known as hold violation. So let us see what how exactly it's happening. Let us just focus on this capture edge. Or let us start from the beginning. Okay, so we have this launch edge. So here you see that clock and clock bar, they are having different, you know. Uh, non overlapping shape why right? because this will be delayed i mean this clock bar will be delayed as compared to clock so clock if it starts here clock bar starts after this propagation delay of three buffers right so now let us look at the launch edge 
So at launch edge, what happens? At launch edge, data from this propagates to this. I mean, after this launch edge, whatever FF1D data was present, it goes at this terminal after TCQ. And then what happens? From FF1Q to FF2D, after this combinational logic delay, it reaches here. It gets inverted because it's a NAND gate. So whatever input was here, it reaches here at this point itself. Now, at this like at this uh, data launch at FF two, it was sampling previous previous uh, previous input, previous cycles input. Now let us look at this capture line. Now let us look at this capture edge. So here for this, the clock arrives. The clock edge arrives earlier. So the clock the positive edge of this clock arrives earlier before the positive edge of clock B, right? Positive edge of clock arrives before positive edge of clock B. Now, once the positive edge arrives here, then this FF1D is transferred to this queue after TCQ. And then that is transferred to your FF2D because this, after this contamination delay, if it is very small, let's say it's very small, it's transferred here. Now, once the capture edge comes for FF2, register, what happens? It sees that the input is changing before the whole time. So that's the problem, right? So desired capture event, because of this delay, which is introduced in the clock bar, capture event should have happened in this FF2 at this instance itself. But because there's this delay in between, what happens? The capturing event is taking place here. And after that, you'll have you need to have some hold time. But you see that you know in this duration, the input is changing. Why it is changing? Because the propagation delay of this system is smaller than the delay which is introduced by this buffer. Right? So there's this hold violation. Okay. Now, how can we you know fix this? How can we fix this? We reduce the delay in this clock line or you increase the delay in this data path, or you increase the delay in here in this clock path as well. That is not a very good thing to do, but that is also probably. In modern circuits, what exactly is the case? As I told earlier also, it's the register propagation delay, that is TCQ, plus the setup time, which is dictating the clock period. Hence, it is very important to understand about these, and I hope you guys understood this from this lecture. Thank you.